So we're on the subject of the qualifications of a biblical leader, and we're still on the subject of covetousness. And covetousness is one of those things that the biblical leader is not supposed to have in, in his heart. You should not be a covetous person. If you're going to be God's man, you're going to have to be a man that is not given to covetousness. Covetousness is a sin, and yet in the Christian world today, that is the thing that most preachers appeal to, to get their congregations, to get their numbers up, to get the big crowds, to get the um, youth rallies and stuff. They appeal to covetousness to get the crowd in. You know, if you love the Lord and uh, you do these laws of spiritual success, then God's going to bless you in these categories. And then they start listing them and they say, well, you know, you need a bigger house and you're going to have about 10 cars and you're going to have so much money in the bank you ain't going to know what to do with it. And, you know, you're going to have fancy clothes and life is going to be kumbaya and you're going to have a lot of... Uh, wealth and health and you'll never get sick and you'll never you'll never feel any pain and no suffering and you'll never um, have any problems and if you do then that means you're out of the will of God and then you're sinning and all that that's what they teach and if you don't know that's what they teach it's because you ain't been in those churches I have I've been in them I used to be a part of them I know exactly what they teach I used to be run circles with them and rich. exactly I mean if you're not rich then you're not in the clique and unfortunately that kind of that kind of gospel that prosperity style gospel has crept into the fundamentalist churches it's not just charismatic churches now that are getting in on this bandwagon, your fundamentalist, your Baptist, your independent Baptist, a lot of them are getting in on the same uh, wheel. They feel like if, you, if you're doing the will of God, you should have a big building, you should have a big Sunday school program, you should have a big gymnasium, you should have a big real estate property, and you should have a school. You should ha I mean, they go through a litany of things. And if you don't have these things, then it's because you're not in the will of God. And that is absolutely not true. Amen. Paul the Apostle never had a Sunday school program. He never had a church building. He never had a bus ministry. He never had um, a big uh, congregation. Uh, he traveled everywhere he went on foot. And if he went on foot, he was riding around on an ass, uh, which was one of the members of Congress. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> And then they, they just took me off on that one. But, um, I mean, he, he, was, he was one of these guys that didn't care. Sometimes he was out in the open field. Sometimes he didn't have a place to lay his head. Sometimes he was out in the middle of the ocean on a plank board, floating around in the water with the sharks running around him. Sometimes he was laying over in a ditch somewhere where he'd been beat half to death for preaching the gospel. What do you mean if you're, pro if you're not prosperous, you're not in the will of God? Paul was in the will of God every day of his life, and he never had any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Amen. He had a lot of scars, he had a lot of wounds, and he said, um, I bear in my body the marks of my Lord Jesus Christ. And what he was talking about there is every time he got a whipping, every time he got a stoning, every time he got a, a scar from somebody that hated him, it was a mark of Jesus Christ where he could sit there and point to people and say, I bear in my hands, I bear in my arms, I bear on my back the marks. He wore it as a badge of honor. He ran a good race. Take your Bible. Yes, he did. Exodus chapter 18. Brother Earl, open us in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word tonight, Lord. Thank you for the fellowship tonight, Lord. We love you. Sometimes we don't love you like we should, Lord. But right. Father, I just pray that you just move in this this uh, congregation, Amen. Lord. Jesus. That your word goes forth, uh, sharper than two edged sword, Lord. And thank you for Pastor Mark as he preaches uh, the gospel to us, Lord. Jesus. And we just ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Exodus 
chapter 18, verse 21, full disclosure tonight, uh, I'm on some medications for my back, you know, I've got the sciatic issue going on, and um, working through that, still in a lot of pain, still in a lot of suffering, um, and now I'm having a reaction due to the medicine, so it's affected my tongue, and my tongue's got some kind of a rash or thrush on it now because of the medication, so I've got some kind of paste that they've given me to put on my tongue. So I may talk a little funny. I don't know. Hopefully not. But if I do, you'll know why. Um, Sound good. But I'm going to preach anyway, okay? Amen. Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. The Bible says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, now here it is, able men. God does not expect you to do what you're not able to do. God only requires you to do what you are able to do. And if you do what God has enabled you to do, and you do that with all your heart, you are in the will of God. God does not expect you to do what you can't do. Some people cannot get in a pulpit. That's okay. God doesn't expect you to. God expects you to be faithful to that. And God's called everybody under the sound of my voice to do something. Now, you know what it is. Amen. And I don't have to tell you what it is. God told you what it is. And some people know what they're supposed to be doing. And they just rebel against the Lord and refuse to do what God told them to do. The Bible says here, moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. Number one, such as fear God. That is your number one priority in this Christian walk. You ought to stay humble before the Lord and fear the Lord. The minute you stop fearing God, you're out of the will of God. The minute you stop fearing what God says and you start worrying about what people think and worrying about what people uh, can do to you and fear man and you switch the category on fear to people, you're out of the will of God and you need to get in the altar and get right and get back in the will of God until you get to a place where God is your fear. Amen. God is the one you are to be afraid of. I don't fear what people do. Yes, sir. I don't really, honestly. I mean, I've been trying on that one, trust me. I, I've had, those words have been tried, tested, proven. I am not afraid of what people think of me. I am not afraid of what people can do to me. What I am afraid of is God. Amen. And I am afraid of what God will do to me if I get outside of where I'm safe. And that is when I'm in danger and I know I'm in danger and I better get back into the shelter because the storm's coming. Amen. The Bible says here, you are to find able men such as fear God. And here's the other thing. Men of truth. <laughs> Boy, that's a tall order these days. Because people today don't know how to tell the truth. People today, I'm talking about people in church. I'm, forget the world. The world don't know no better. The church does though. And there's a lot of preachers that will lie to you just as soon as look at you. And there's a lot of people in the ministry that will lie to you just as soon as to be in your presence. The Bible wants you to have a bunch of people that are men of truth. People that don't are not afraid to speak, thus saith the Lord. And the men of truth are going to, first of all, have a love for the truth. What is the truth? The Bible tells you in John 17, 17, that sanctify them. This Jesus' high priestly prayer to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, that right there, thy word is truth. So if you're a man of truth, you're a man of the Bible. And the moment you get out of the Bible, you stop being a man of truth. You got to stay in that Bible, you got to stay with that Bible, and you got to hold that Bible as your final authority. It don't matter what the world thinks about you. It don't matter what the scholastics think about you. It don't matter what people think about you. It don't matter what your mom and daddy think about you, your husband, your wife, your children. 
It don't even matter what you think about you. It matters about what God thinks. And God says you are to be a man of truth. And that means you are to hold this book in high regard. You are to be a man of truth. And then the next thing. The next thing here is the part we don't like to talk about. It says hating. Everybody say hate. 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 See, in order to love some things, brother, oh, you got to hate some things. I mean, this, this, this sloppy, gooey, uh, kindergarten, Snoopy, peanut gang kind of Christianity that's going around today says God doesn't hate anything and God doesn't hate anybody. God just loves everything and everybody. So we can all get in the slot pen and wallow together and nothing, there's no problem. But there is a problem because you have perverted who God is. Number one, God is holy. And number one, God is separate, separate, and I say separate, separate, separate from sinners. Alright? That means he cannot touch sin. And that means if you got sin on your soul, he cannot touch you. He will not be contaminated by sin. I don't care how you placate it. I don't care how many times you put it on TV. I don't care how many times you kumbaya it. God hates sin. And the Bible says that if you're going to love God, you're going to have to hate covetousness. Amen. Amen. And if you're going to be a man of God, a biblical leader, one that's qualified, not one of these sap heads that went to college, <laughs> a qualified biblical leader, you're going to have to hate covetousness because that is the number one temptation in the ministry. Let me just say that again. That is the number one Temptation in the ministry, especially today. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I mean, money is thrown around everywhere in the ministry. And preachers, when they get in the pulpit, they think about money. And when they get out of the pulpit, they think about money. When they go home, they think about money. When they get up in the morning, they think about money. When they go to bed at night, they think about money. And when they eat at lunchtime at the buffet bar, they're thinking about money. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And God told you not to do that. Forget the money. Question. And I've done this in some classes I've done with preachers. I've asked them. If money was off the table, and it may be one day, yeah. maybe in your own personal ministry one day, if money was off the table, would you be as motivated to get in the in the Service for the Lord and preach? Good question. <laughs> Would you? If nobody was willing to pay you to go hear them preach, go hear you preach, and they wanted you to go across town, would you take your time and do it like you do now? Would you prepare? Question. If somebody asks you to go across country and go ask you to preach, and they want a dime in it, except you just get there and get back, would you do it? Now, you'd be surprised at the answers. I know because I have put it to the test with some of these rascals. You know what I mean? I mean this. I mean there has been preachers that I have known other preachers that would try to get to come to their church and preach, and they wouldn't even entertain the idea unless a certain amount of money was on the table. Now, that's what I'm talking about. You say, well, it costs money. I, don't, don't give me that junk. <laughs> I know what it costs to try. Okay? And I also know that i got a God that can provide. Yeah, amen. And I'm going to tell you something. I practiced this one, too. I've gone across. I've gone all over the place. I've been to Virginia. I've been to South Carolina. I've been down to Florida. I've been all over the place. And I preached. <laughs> and I didn't get anything. You didn't go hungry. And I still preached. Just as hard and good as if I had been a thousand dollar day. Amen. Amen. Me and my wife have been in places where they said, Preacher, we really want to have you come here, come and preach for us, but we don't have nothing to give you. Don't worry about that. Don't let that keep you from asking me to come. They fed you. <laughs> I'm going to go anyway. I'm not worried about money, folks. I think you figured that out about this church. We don't we don't fret on the little things. Because that's really a little thing. In fact, I took the collection plate 
I, I, this is the only church I know of that don't pass a collection plate. I don't. Maybe there's some others. I don't know. But this one don't. And we don't worry about the collection plate. We got a box back there. We tell people about it. If you want to give, you can give. If you don't, you don't. That's between you and God. But we are not worried about that. Don't hinder what we're doing here. We're going to do what God wants us to do here, regardless of whether you put anything in there or not. Amen. And God's going to provide whether you put anything in there or not. But the thing about it is, one of the things God taught me about this thing is, you don't worry about the money. The money will come. You worry about this. You preach my word and you hate covetousness. And you let them have it, boy. I mean, you give it to them. And you let them have it good. I came from... Uh, rough line of preachers. I mean, my my bringing up preaching was preachers. Well, of course, you know, Brother Ruckman. I mean, he's pretty rough, and um, I've, I've listened to. Um, uh, well, he's he's good, but I mean, I'm talking about some of these old dogs that would skin your hide, buddy. I'm talking about like the Mordecai Hams and the. Uh, these preachers like Bob Jones Sr. and uh, these old old rascals like uh, Billy Sunday. And, and, and I mean, when Billy Sunday get in the pulpit, man, he'd scream at you if he fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he'd jump about 10 foot high and slammed on the floor and holler at you and say, there's a fire! <laughs> and the man would jump up and... <laughs> And then, and the man would jump up and say, "Where, where?" And he said, "For everybody falls asleep under the gospel, man, you are gonna miss something that might wind up causing you to go to hell." And he never fell asleep again. But listen, these old dogs, man, when they get in a town and go to preaching and do these evangelistic services, man, they clean house. I mean, when they get done in a town, they won't nobody in the jailhouse. Right. Amen. Now, that's the kind of preaching I grew up under. I grew up under preachers, but they tear your hide apart in the pulpit. I mean, they get across, and they go running up and down the aisles. I mean, the, the people were running in the altars. I mean, my old pastor that, that led me to Christ, man, he, he'd get up there and preach a sermon on hell, but he'd be up there about almost two hours preaching, and he'd be soaking wet by the time the thing done. By the time he got done, he didn't even have to give an altar call. You know why? Because everybody was already in the altar. That's the kind of preaching I grew up under. I've seen that. I've witnessed that. And they want these saphead preachers that's running around like Joel Osteen that got their smile on and, 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 and they got these face lifts and they got a permanent tattoo on their face. I mean, it's not that kind of stuff, folks. It's the kind of preacher that says if you don't get right with God, God's going to have an account with you and He's going to have an encounter with you and you better get that thing settled or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Amen. And they won't worry about money. What they were concerned about is preaching what God said. Period. They might have people out there not. <laughs> I, I watched a preacher one time get up in a pulpit. I know I'm kind of reminiscent here, but bear with me for a minute. I knew, I, knew, I had a preacher one time. He, used to, he came down there in Duplin County, one of the churches down there, and he was doing a revival, and that revival was supposed to be a one-week revival, and it wound up being about a 12-week revival. <laughs> I mean, everybody in the county was there. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, he got done with that place. He, he, he scolded that church that he was preaching in. <laughs> Hey. He told them that there was something evil in that church that was taking over that whole church. Wow. And buddy, there was people in the altar weeping and crying and people begging their children to get saved. I mean, they were they were having revival. See, revival is not this stuff where you, you run up and down the aisle and you just feel good. Revival is when you get in the altar and you're begging God to save your children and save your loved ones and really and from the heart of begging from the heart that God will do something for you. And you've got your heart cleaned out. That's revival. Revive, that means to make alive again. And a lot of people are dead in church and they need to be made alive again. And God says here in this verse here, He says we need some men that fear God and men that preach the truth and hate covetousness. 
hate this stuff about, you know, this prosperity Christianity stuff where everybody's promised a brand new car. Me and Carrie went to church one time where the lady got up in the pulpit, and this was blasphemous. If you ever heard anything blasphemous, this was it. She said, if you people will run around this church seven times, uh, God will give you A, B, and C. I mean, she listed all these things. She said, if you'll run around this church three or four times, you know, God will give you this, and God will give you that. And it's just appealing to people's lust for the money and the wealth and the prosperity. And then she said, I see God shooting out cannons of money in this church. Folks, let me tell you something. Just because somebody said God said something or God showed them something, don't you believe a word of it. Unless you can find it in the Word of God, you better be careful. Right. You better be very careful and very skeptical. Right. There's people out there, I've been out there preaching on the street before, and these do-gooders come up to me and said, Brother, the Holy Spirit sent me over here to tell you that you're doing more damage to the body of Christ than you are good. I've had them do that to me, just like you had them do it to you now. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a demonic spirit that's going that. They're trying to stop you from preaching God's Word. They're demonic. You better, you better rebuke. You better, you better get the Lord involved in that one. <laughs> the Lord rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> Amen. All right. Hating covetousness and plating such over them. To be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Notice the categories. God has sections that he'll section that thing off and he'll say, all right, this group over here, this group over here, this group over here, and this group over here. But the qualifications is what I want you to notice. Able men. The Marine Corps used to have a motto. Looking for a few. <laughs> Good men. Amen. Now, the Marine Corps motto is we're looking for a few sissies. Seriously. Yeah. It's gotten that bad in there now. Yeah. It's gotten so bad down there at Paris Island, brother. I was told recently that they got these things now where they got these stress cards that they can hold up to the drill instructors. What a bunch of junk. But when I was in there, you, the only stress that you had, the only stress relief you had is to, is to get out of the way. <laughs> And if you were in the way, buddy, they're going to knock you upside your head and get you back in line. Yeah, right. yeah. Amen. They jack you upside the wall and you, you, didn't, make, you, didn't, you didn't misunderstand. Yeah. You knew exactly what was going on. Oh, yeah. And after that, you had an attitude adjustment and you, you knew exactly what, was, what time it was. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It's a different story now. They don't, they don't even run anymore from what I've heard. Yeah, I'm just telling you, folks. I mean, I, my brother's down there at uh, Camp Lejeune right now working, and he told me that these guys are down there with their hair out long, and they're, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you'd be shocked, brother. We need to take a trip down there. <laughs> Maybe we don't. <laughs> Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 119. We better not do that. We'll bind up in the brig. <laughs> Psalm 119. Look at verse 36. Psalm 119 verse 36. Listen to what he says. Incline my ear unto... Excuse me. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies. This is David's prayer. Incline my heart under thy testimonies and not to covetousness. You know why he prayed that? Because he's prone to covetousness. Mm -hmm. It is a temptation. It is a besetting sin. And it will creep into your life before you realize it. And let me tell you something. Have you got a TV in your house? Have you got internet in your house? Have you got a smartphone? Then you have got some devices at your disposal that all they are doing day and night, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, is enticing you to be a covetous person. That's what their whole gimmick is. They're counting on your desire, your covetousness, and their ability to market it to get you enticed to buy what they want you to buy. They'll tell you you need junk that you don't need. And they'll tell you you've got to have it. I mean, it's the latest. It's the most important. And you've got to have it today. I mean, if you don't get it today, you're going to die. I mean, you, the world's going to end tomorrow if you don't have this in your house. And uh, if you don't have this, it's your you know, That kind of stuff. And that's covetousness that they're appealing to. 
and Americans love it. And David said, incline my heart unto what? Thy testimonies. What is that, the Word of God? That Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the testimonies of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And, God, and David said, I want you to take my heart and I want you to incline it to thy testimonies. Instead of covetousness. In other words, I am prone to go after covetousness, but I want you to take my heart, Lord, and bring it over here and steer it into this, not this out here. Amen. See? Amen. All right, go to Proverbs twenty-eight sixteen. You're going to be a biblical leader. You're going to have to figure this out now because it's going to take a lot. Of, and I'll tell you something. This is going to require you to get on your knees. Amen. And, and, and spend some time in prayer before the Lord. You ain't going to get battle. Uh, you ain't going to get the victory over covetousness, rather, unless you're on your knees before the Lord. I'm just telling you, you ain't going to do it. It ain't going to happen. If you think you can got enough willpower to do it, you have underestimated the devil. Because the devil knows what works. And God knows what works. And you know what Jesus Christ said? This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. You're going to have to push that plate away. Alright. Proverbs 28.16 The prince that wanteth understanding. Now, a prince is a ruler, right? Yeah. All right. The prince that wanteth understanding. That's a biblical leader. Which verse is that? Verse 16, 28, 16. The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor. oppressor. But... He that hateth covetousness uh -huh, shall what? Prolong his days. You know why? Because the more junk you have, the more stress you have. The more stress you have, the more health problems you have, and the more worry you have, and the more you have to... Look, these multi-million dollar, uh, high dollar people that run around, flying around in these private jets and have these uh, butlers and caterers and stuff. You know, I was at an event here a while back, just a few days ago, where I rubbed shoulders with some of these millionaires and looking around at them and just, I just, I look at them and I see their faces and I looked at their faces and I'm, it was a teaching moment for me. I mean, the Lord just teaches me things when I'm out and about doing these things. And I look at these people, these, these multi-million dollar movie stars and music stars, and I'm looking at them and I'm looking in their face. And many of these guys, they have this blank stare. They got all the money in the world that a man can want. And yet they're the most unhappy individuals you will ever encounter, most of them. The only exception to that rule is those that have found Christ. Yeah, amen. I, I was in front of one of them, and he commented on the crucifix. So I knew he was a believer. <laughs> Had a little conversation with him about it. And, but the rest of them, you can see it. It's, it's there. And the Bible says here, a man that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Think about some of these movie stars and these famous people that have died tragic deaths at a young age, blowing their brains out, committing suicide, dying of sudden heart attacks. Even, even in the football and sports uh, area where these guys are making $42, $32 million a year, etc., etc., and they're dropping dead on the fields. What's that money going to do for you, bud? What is that money going to do at the end of the day? Not Nothing. But a man that will hate covetousness. See, so you don't have to be controlled by the money. You can control the money. Amen. Amen. You can say, hey, this money is a tool and a means to an end. And it don't control me. I control it. That's and right. the quicker I can get it out and get it out there to do the work of the Lord, the better off I'm going to be. 
I had a brother up to say one time he got some a big large amount of money and boy he got nervous about that thing and he was just figuring out all the ways he could get it out of his hand quick. Because he knew the longer it sat in his hand, the more temptations he would have. And that's true. And it's, uh, it's honorable that a man of his stature and, and, and his grace and uh, knowledge and understanding and the scriptures and wisdom would admit something like that. You know? It's humbling. He knows his limitations. I know mine. I often say, man, if you give me a chance, give me a chance at it. Give me a chance at that lottery, boy. I'll show you what I can. I, could, I believe I could. I really do, brother. I believe I could. I believe I could show some people some things. But, but the Lord ain't seen fit to do it. So He knows something I don't. <laughs> All right, or else He give, or else He give it to me. All right, look at this thing now. Go to Isaiah fifty-seven. Isaiah fifty-seven. I'm content with my little uh, suburb in the corner. <laughs> 50, and all my little barns. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm a happy man, folks. I got peace like a river. <laughs> I am blessed and I thank God for my blessing and I don't I don't regret a day that God has given me in this corner. I mean I, me and my wife went out uh flower shopping today. We didn't spend a dime. We probably got about five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars worth of flowers, and we have to pay anything for them. We call them roadside specials, and, uh, and it simply means that you go over there beside the road at these abandoned places, and they say you can get them. You can get them as long as you're on the state side. You can get them. We've already made the phone calls. We're allowed to do it. We ain't stealing. We checked into it. Um, we were given the green light, and that's what we've been doing for years. That's how we got what we got out here. We didn't buy all these flowers. The Lord just leads us to places and says, Oh, there's a bundle, there's a bundle, there's a bundle. I get my shovel, and we go right on in there, and we just have ourselves a good time. <laughs> and you know what? There's a lot of joy in that. Me and my wife do that together. We have fun with that, man. Exercise. Put our smile on your face. And the beauty of God's little flowers just blooming up everywhere and popping and just watching that thing go. And the Bible says Solomon in all his glory was not a red like one of these. Amen. Amen. And I got a whole yard full of them. <laughs> Amen. All right, look at this one. Isaiah 57. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, For the iniquity... Of his covetousness was our wrath. This is the Lord speaking. And smote him. He's talking about Israel. And hid me. And was wroth. And he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. That's talking about Israel as a nation. When they turned against the Lord. They turned against the Lord. And part of their problem was their covetousness. And the Bible says that God in that moment hid himself from them. You want to cross reference to it? Go to Matthew 13 44. I'll show you something. A lot of people read this and miss it. I missed it for years. <laughs> it's the little words that you got to pay attention to. Matthew 13 44. 13 44. Again, Jesus is giving a parable here. The kingdom of what? Heaven. And I don't mean God. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, what's that next part say? He hideth. He's not hiding the treasure. That's how it's been read for years. I've heard preachers preach that for years. The treasure's hid in the field. The treasure's hid in the field. That is not what that verse says. Not one single time, any time, any way you want to read it. It says, He hid. The Lord hid. You see that? It says, He hideth. It didn't say, He hideth the treasure. It says, He hideth. And for joy there goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Well, when did he do that, Calvary? <laughs> Amen. 
He hid in the midst of them, didn't he? Yeah. Don't your Bible say that they went to stone him and the Bible says he hid himself and walked through the midst of them? Yeah. You want to see that one? Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Nope. John chapter 8. Verse 57. He does it on a couple of occasions. Here's an example of one. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus saith unto Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily I say unto you, Before Abraham was what? I am. It doesn't say I was. <laughs> And you know what a Jew heard when he heard him say that? He heard Exodus chapter 3 being repeated where God said, I am that I am. And when you go to Moses, when you go to Pharaoh Moses, you tell them the I am have sent thee. And when Jesus stood in front of those people, he said, before Abraham was, buddy, I am. And when they heard him say that, they knew exactly what he meant. You know how I know? Because read the next verse. Then took they up stones to cast at him. They considered him to be a blasphemer. But look at what Jesus does. This shows you he's God. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through what? The Somehow Jesus is able to take that body he's in and cause it to disappear and walk through him. <laughs> My Lord. That's Jesus. And he walked right on through him. And so passed by. You know why? Because he said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down at will and I take it up at will. And nobody killed Jesus Christ on the cross. He let them kill him. When he got to the appointed destination, he said, all right, it's time to do it. And he laid his hands out there and let them do what they were going to do. And when they nailed him up on that tree, he could have called all the angels in glory down on that situation. And he did not do it. He could have done it. He could have stopped the whole thing any moment. He didn't do it. He had that kind of power. He had the power to look at a man and say, uh, who are you looking for? In the garden, right before they arrested him, and he said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And when he said that, buddy, power hit him, and it knocked him back. <laughs> that would have been enough for me, Brother Earl. I would have, I would have went ahead and gone home. Mama, get supper ready. I'm coming home right now. That's the end of the deal right there. I'm not messing with this man anymore. That was it. <laughs> that would have been enough for me right there. I, that's good enough for me, buddy. You got it. But they didn't. They continued to pursue him. You know why? Because there was something pushing them to do it. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. All right, Covetousness is what we're talking about. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 13. Now the Lord, well, let's go back to verse 11 to get the context. The Bible says, therefore, chapter 6 verse 11, therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. Is that you? Folks, there's, time, there's times in this Christian walk where you need to get angry. Amen. And stay angry. Amen. Yeah. Stay angry at the devil and stay angry at sin. And stay angry at the devil's people. Amen. And a lot of those people in the church house, you need to be angry with them and stay angry at them. Amen. The Bible says, Therefore I am full of the fear of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. In other words, Jeremiah said, I'm tired of not opening my mouth hold back my tongue so to speak amen. amen I am tired of not saying anything amen. so the Lord says alright <laughs> let them have it <laughs> I am weary with holding in I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together for even the husband with the wife shall be taken the age with him that is full of days. So here's a warning. He's telling them, this is what's getting ready to happen. Their houses shall be turned unto others. 
with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. From the, for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to what? There's the United States of America right now, and the majority of the churches in this country fit that category to a T. The moment your church gets the attitude that they are a business and not a ministry, you have fit this bill. Yeah. Amen. And you ought to repent and get yourself right with God. The church is not a business. Amen. Period. Amen. And the moment you make it a business, shut the doors. Go home. Play golf. Do something honest. Because when you make the church a business, you are blaspheming the Lord. The word. From even the prophet, even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. You know why covetousness is dangerous? Because it causes the preacher to tiptoe through the uh, Bible. Now he can't preach what God says. He's got to preach what the people want to hear. <laughs> so certain topics become off. Uh, certain subjects become off. You can't talk about them. If I talk about this, I'll offend this group, and they'll leave the church, and they're big contributors. And if I if I if I stop talking, if I start talking about this particular sin, this family is going to leave, and and they give a bunch of money to the Sunday school program, and uh, and they're here every Sunday, and they're always giving big offerings, and we can't have that. If I, after a while, you can't preach nothing. That's right. And it becomes positive slump. Yeah, that's right. Amen. I've seen it. I've seen if you got a Bible and you've read through it, and you've at least read through it a couple of times, one thing you'll find out very quickly about the Bible, it is negative 75% of the time. Amen. It is. 25 to 30% of the time, it's positive. And that positive is predicated on what you're going to do with that negative. <laughs> that's right. Amen. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's the Bible. That's not Hollywood. That's not the church world today. That's the scriptures. And I get sick and tired of hearing these naysayers and these good doers run around and say, Jesus is positive. Jesus is positive. Jesus wouldn't talk like that. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus this and Jesus that. And they don't know him. Because if they did, they wouldn't say what they're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, sister. The Word of God reveals Jesus Christ, and the Jesus Christ that's being peddled along Christianity today ain't the Jesus of the Bible. I can tell you that right now. You know what my Jesus was? He was a warrior. Brother, he went to the temple and he didn't patty cake. <laughs> He got him a core, a, a scourge of cords, and he went to town. Sweet little Jesus, you know, one laying in a manger. <laughs> he went in there, he grew up. <laughs> he went in there and he cleaned out house. He said, my father's house is not going to be a den of thieves. It's a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. How did they do it? Covetousness. Covetousness. They, they looked at the people as merchandise. We can sell some stuff to them now. We can get, we can get them in here and we can buy we can entice them to get this. And they do, they, 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 they do such a good job. I mean, they have all the right religious terms they use when they do it, brother. They'll say, if you love the Lord, <laughs> yeah. you'll buy the CD. You know what it is? That's witchcraft. Yeah. Tyson. That's witchcraft. You're using some kind of enticement to get somebody to spend some money on your little product that you put together. If you love the Lord, what do you mean if I love the Lord, I'll buy your CD? No, I love the Lord and I'm going to stay in His Word. Your CD is irrelevant. Now, it might be a blessing to me. Don't get me wrong. I love gospel music. I love gospel preaching. But don't you come at me with that. If you love the Lord, you'll... Mm. Don't ever do that. Amen. Mm -mm. If I love the Lord, I'll read His Word. You can come at me with that one. I'll take that one. Because that's true. That is true. Anything else outside of that, you're putting yourself on the same level as Jesus Christ. Be careful with that. The Bible says they're given to covetousness. 
Um, the Bible says, from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, look at this, peace, peace. When there is no peace, you better mark that one. The Pope runs around and does that all the time. He runs around the whole world talking about peace, peace, peace. And he's got two fingers up just like that. And he's sitting around and he's doing this number right here. He's mocking the cross of Christ by doing that. And he's running around saying peace, peace, peace. And this is a military signal that means attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just like that. Mm -hmm. Bible says here, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Absolutely not. Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At that time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. That's what's going to happen to America. That's what's going to happen to American churches. You take American churches and try to plant them in other places, you find a peculiar thing that happens. These other places that have church that know what church is, when these American outfits come over there, they laugh at them. You know why? Because the first thing they say is, we don't mix the world with God. That's right. That's right. We don't dance to your music. <laughs> we don't sing to your music. And we certainly don't beat to your drum. We worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And Amen. this Bible is our authority. Amen. That's it. All right, take your Bible and let's look at another one. Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. Probably ain't going to make it tonight. Jeremiah 18. Therefore will I give their wives unto others in their fields to them that shall inherit them for every one from the least and even to the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Notice how this prophet and priest keep showing up. And that is a representation of the ministry and that's where the problem lies the head is sick therefore the body's sick see the problem in Christianity today is not the pew it's the pulpit that's the problem my beef is with the preachers that's my beef I have an issue with the preachers and their methodology, if you will, and their exegesis and their whatever you want to call it, because they have forsaken the word of the Lord and have run after the word of men. And they are looking for the ways of the world to get people into church. Let me tell you something. If you've got to get pizza to get somebody in church, they're coming for the wrong reason. Amen. Amen. They ought to come to church whether there's a pizza party or not. And the moment you start introducing that as the means and method of getting them in, you're going to have to keep that as the means and method to keep them in. The moment you take it out, they'll leave. And they're not interested in that Bible. They're interested in that pizza. Amen. I ain't got a problem with people eating in church, but I got a problem with people that come to church to eat. <laughs> you know, I've been to some of these places where that's all they do is put the, money, the food out there or the TV programming out there. And they'll say, here, if you come to this service this night, you'll get to do this and you'll get to do that. And, you'll, and, and the Word of God don't even come into play. I've been there. That's probably, yeah, I mean, we all have, I think, here. Uh, and that's why this church was started, because of that nonsense. New church one time they had an upstairs uh, group and all they did was sit around and play games and uh, do pizza party every time church was going on the youth would go up there and do pizza party and, and play games nobody preached the word of God nobody opened the Bible nobody cracked the Bible open one time and they called that church they were in church though. they were in church so they thought they were having church Take your Bible and go to Jeremiah. I will not compromise what I said. I will preach that till the day I die. Amen. Jeremiah twenty two seventeen. And the preachers get nervous when they. This is why I don't go to. This is why I don't get invited, brother, because I, I mess up their programs. I mess up their their methodologies, and they don't like that because it makes them nervous. They say you going you go. I've had them pull me. Don't preach on this, please. I mean, this is we do this here. Are you gonna preach on that? 
That's what you preach on. And, and, and you know what? <laughs> That's it. Jeremiah twenty two seventeen. Yeah. I don't get invited back. Jeremiah twenty two seventeen. But mine eyes and thine heart, but thine eyes and thine heart are not, but for thy covetousness. Notice it's an eye and heart issue. Covetousness starts in the heart, but it's enticed through the eyes. That's why you got the advertisers out here constantly in your face. That's what Facebook's about. That's what Twitter's about. That's what Instagram's about. That's what TikTok's about. That's what any of these other social media outlets are about. YouTube. That's what CNN, ABC, CBS, and all the other BS is out there. They are all about enticing you through the eyes to buy what they're selling. And it gets down into the heart. Think about the clothes fads of the world. Men running around wearing dresses now. Oh my God. And it's becoming a common thing. It used to be that you see somebody like that, you know, it, it, it was a weird thing. I mean, you just didn't see that kind. Especially didn't sit down south. Yeah. You might see it, but they, they wouldn't be around long. <laughs> now... It's a, I mean, men walking around with makeup. Abomination. Men walking around looking like women and feminine. This stuff is an abomination, and God says it starts with the eyes. See, the, the world, the media, the Hollywood crowd, they have to brainwash you by getting you to look at something. That's why God told you in the Old Testament to not have images, Amen. idols, images. Think about this for a minute. Image. An image has not changed. It's just changed the way it's presented. What do we call steel pictures in the movie industry? Steel images. See? And they put them things out there. And your eyes is trying to take that stuff in. And they're just brainwashing you, and the devil's sitting back there saying, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you to change your mind on this thing. I'm going to make you think. You know who started that stuff? I'll tell you how. I was watching a show the other day, and I think the guy's funny. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not trying to put a damper on your party if you like TV. Yeah, I like TV too, okay? I'm just smart. <laughs> <laughs> When I watch it, I, I, I recognize what I'm looking at. Amen. And I noticed this subtility was coming along there through the all in the family crowd with Meathead, little jerk, running in there and talking about the Bible was a myth. I watched the program the other day, he was running around talking about the Bible. Oh, it's a myth. It's a, and he said it so quick. And it ran right on to something else. But see, I picked up on it. I said, Carrie, did you hear it say that? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? <laughs> See, the world that day, they hear that stuff here, but it gets down in here. See, I got a filter that blocks it. Amen. It gets up here, but the Holy Spirit said, no! Nope. <laughs> Not in here. Not today. Not anyhow, anyway, buddy. Amen. There's a roadblock right here, and you ain't getting past it. Amen. And uh, the Lord said, now you look at that. That was going on in the seventies. Goes all the way back to goes all the way back to the fifties. Goes further than that. Goes back to the forties. It goes further than that. It goes all the way back to the roaring twenties. You know what was going on in the roaring twenties, folks? Women's lib. It was in high gear. You know what women were running around doing back then? Now, bobbing their hair. You know what the Bible says about that? A woman's hair is given to her for her glory. A woman should have cut her hair short. I'm a stickler on that, bro. I mean, this is the Bible. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to apologize for that. You say, well, the times. I don't care about the times. Amen. I can care less about culture. <laughs> culture can go to the devil. All I care. When the culture says one thing and the Bible says something else, culture can go to the devil, as Billy Sunday used to say. Amen. Go plumb to the devil. See? 
When the word of God says a woman's hair, and she ought not, in other words, the Bible says if a woman cuts her hair, she ought to shave her head. That's Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go read it. I didn't write that. Paul did. Take it up with him. That's right. Amen. I'm not going to change it either. I kind of like it. <laughs> Jeremiah 22, 17 says this. It says, um, But thine eyes and thy heart are not but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. See? It's a heart and an eye thing. They're interconnected. Go to Jeremiah 51, 13. 51.13 Jeremiah was a man. He was, but you know what? Jeremiah didn't have one convert. So by the day's standards and today's preacher standards, he wasn't a success. He was a failure. According to the modern day preachers of, the, of America today, he was a failure because he had no converts and he had no church and he had no bus program and he had no Sunday school program and he didn't have any little children sitting around there to speak goo goo and then gaga. Well, let me tell you something about Jeremiah. He may not have been married, he may not have had no converts, he may not have had a house to live in. He may have stayed stinking and dirty all his life. But I'm going to tell you something about the man. He knew his God. And he knew his God's word. And he preached it. And he preached it faithfully. Amen. He preached it. And he stirred him up, buddy. And today, that Bible, that he wrote that book in that Bible, is still touching people today. And it's still stirring up people and making people mad. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 51.3. Look at this one. 51.3. Jeremiah 51.3. Look at this one. Excuse me. 51.13. I missed it again. All right. 13. O thou that dwellest upon many waters. Here's America. Abundant in treasures. Here's America. Thine end is come. Let's get out there and preach that on the street sometime. And the measure of thy covetousness, the Lord of hosts hath sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causeth the vapors to ascend in the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, the work of errors. The time of their visitation, they shall perish. You want to memorize that. Because America's got a graven image that she puts in front of her every, every morning when she cuts that dial on. And she looks at that graven image, and she lets that graven image tell her how to think, how to look, how to act, how to speak how to do, and she allows that graven image to dictate everything about her, anything, in every, every, every category. The Bible says, they are vanity and the work of errors. And the church world has got the same kind of graven image going on in the church. You know what it is? It's scholarship, education. There have they, there's churches in this country today, and it's a shame to their credit. It, it, it is a shame. It's a shame on them. It's not a badge of honor. It's a shame to them. They will not allow a man to get in a pulpit unless he's got an education, and that is a crime against God. Amen. There's plenty of preachers in this country that can out preach any of these educated asses, and they know exactly what they're saying, and they're hearing from God because they're on their face before the Lord. And these educated crowd think that they've got a monopoly on people because they went to college, Yale, or whatever it is they went to, and went to Bob Jones or Tennessee Temple, wherever it is they went, and they think that that's their calling. That's not your calling. Your calling is when you got on your face before God and He said, Preach! And you preach. <laughs> that's the calling. Amen. And I'd rather have a man in the pulpit that knows this Bible and not be educated a day in his life than a man that's educated and don't know anything about God. 
Yeah. And that is a possibility and a reality in this country. Sad, sad, brother, sad. So they, they, they push this work of errors. I'm educated. I'm educated, so the Greek says. A better translation should be, the NIV should say, and the New American Standard says, and the Mickey Mouse version says this over here, and the Pluto version is over here in this corner, and we ain't even going to talk about Goofy. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about him. <laughs> Go to Ezekiel chapter 33. <laughs> Ezekiel. I didn't say anything about it. I just mentioned his name. Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. Look at verse 31. Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto thee as people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. Uh-oh. Notice how he worded that. They sit before thee as my people. Boy, I've been in the ministry for a long time. I've been in this thing for 30 some years. And I've seen people come in this in, in churches and sit there and pretend to be God's people. But when that word of God goes forth, buddy, it exposes them for what they really are and they cannot stand around uh, not long. See, that Bible will strip you naked. It'll expose you. You can hide behind whatever thing you're hiding behind, but the Word of God's quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is a discerner. Say <laughs> it. Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And But when that thing gets done with you, you won't know whether you're coming or going. And there's a lot of people that sit in church, pretend to be saved, pretend to be right, pretend to be holy, pretend to be Christian. And when the Word of God goes forth, you'll find out where they are. You know why? Because they won't stay long. Not in a place like this, they won't. They can't handle this place. I told somebody the other day at work when I was at, and I won't say this in a bragging manner, I was saying as serious as I can be, and as a, actually as a burden on my heart. I won't brag. It's just the reality of it. I said, sweetheart, talking to the lady, she's talking about the church and the message. I said, sweetheart, I'm a controversial preacher. I preach a lot of controversial things. I preach things that gets me kicked off Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, and name your category, and I'm probably out. You know why? Because I don't compromise this to appeal that. And I'm not going to. Amen. I'm going to preach what God said, and it don't matter if I get on social media or not. That's the word. That's the way it is. And it's going to come a day. Listen to me now. Well, I'm not going to be alone in that situation. It's going to be a day when you open up a King James Bible and open your mouth, and they ain't going to let you say nothing on these social networks. And I'm warning you right now, and those that are listening to me by CD, wherever these CDs may go, I'm telling you, don't you give up your physical copy of your Bible and replace it with one of these internet copies where you can get online and look at it. Don't you dare do that. Because there's going to come a time where if you get relying on that and you don't have a physical copy of that Bible, there's going to come a time when that thing's going to glitch and that thing's going to disappear and you ain't going to have a Bible and the only Bible you're going to be able to have and handle is this physical copy that I'm holding in my hands. So you better not give this up for that. Amen. I didn't say you couldn't have that in addition to this, but you better keep your copy of this. Yes. I've seen too many Christians doing that these days where they're, they're getting too comfortable with these smart devices, where they're looking at their Bibles on these smart devices. I'm concerned about that. I'm sorry, I'm old-fashioned. Maybe call me old-fashioned, call me whatever you want to. But when, when them ID chip things goes across the sky and zaps all these computers and everything goes out, where's your Bible then? Amen. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Um, where are we at? 31. Okay. The Bible says they sit uh, before thee as my people and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. Love you, brother. Love you. Love you. Love you, preaching, brother. Love you. 
Love it. I've had a brother, I'm telling you, me and Carrie, when we start seeing people do that, we get nervous. You know why? Because every time we see people doing that kind of stuff, about two weeks after they do it, they leave. We've had that happen on more than one occasion, several occasions. I've had guys come up to me. I got you, brother. I got you back. I don't care if everybody leaves you, brother. I'm with you, brother. I don't care if we have to meet in a cornfield. I had a guy tell me that one time. I said, I'll meet you in a cornfield, man. We, we, I, I got you, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm with you all the way. Two weeks later, he was gone. No explanation. No goodbye. No sayonara. No nothing. Go to his house to try to find out what the problem is. And wouldn't you know it, there's a woman involved. And she did not like my preaching. <laughs> I had preached a message that says, you better put God before your children. Did you hear what I said? Put God before your children. And she would not do that, and she thought that was offensive, and she said, I'm not putting anything before my children. I said, sweetheart, if you don't put God before your children, God will kill your children. Yeah. And that's what it took right there. So she left. And the lady, same thing. Would you, preacher? Love you, preacher. You're the best preacher. Oh, we just thank the Lord of you, preacher. <laughs> Appreciate that. I mean, honestly, I do. I appreciate when people tell me that. Don't misunderstand me. But we've just been around the block a few times, and we got a few hard knocks, and we see these things. And next thing we know, we get another Sunday, and we get a Dear John letter. Or no letter. And the Dear John letter was, we're leaving, and, you know, it's nothing against you. We just, we, we need some music, and we need a music program. We need a Sunday school. And she went through this litany of things she needed, you know. After telling me a week before that those things weren't important. After me getting her husband in church that never would step foot in a church before that time. And we had got him to a place where he'd come to church and was coming and getting something out of the, the message and getting something out of the church family. And then she comes behind that and sabotaged the whole thing and got him out. That's the kind of stuff you deal with. And that's what he's talking about here in verse 31. They will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love. But oh, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Be careful what kind of junk you allow to get in your heart. I think I told y'all this a few weeks back. Lord, this is my prayer. Gently remove every idol that may be in my heart that would hinder me from doing what you want me to do. Get rid of the covetousness. Get rid of everything. You know what Paul said? Paul says if you got clothes and food, that's all you need. Amen. That's all you need. Amen. And I testify to that. And I asked. I've lived in my van. I've lived on the street. Amen. I've lived out in the field. I've lived, I mean, I've been some places, folks. I've seen some things. My wife has too. And, and, and we've learned that no matter what state we're in to be content, we know that no matter what's going on around us, God is taking care of it and He's in control. He's got you. He's got you. I'm going to close on that note. Carrie, we're going to pick up next week on Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 9. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness. Thank you for this book. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for this ministry that you've allowed us to be able to set forth and uh, preach the word of God and give us a platform to get your word out to the people, Lord. And I just pray, God, that you'll continue to bless this church, continue to bless those that come and hear the word of God. Put a heart desire in their spirit to continue to do and uh, do everything they can for the Lord with all their might, all their soul, all their heart, all their strength, Lord. And I just pray as we go from this place tonight, Lord, you'll keep us safe until we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.